We are back on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. And for those that are kind of looking left and looking right, they're saying, wait a minute. How come the guys aren't on video? Mm -hmm. Well, we're only audio this week because um, me and the guys, Dave Archer, DJ Shockley, hello, fellas. Um, we are going to be moving into some fancy new studios here very soon. Well, let's be real. We, 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 none of us got haircuts. so I Yeah, mean, I mean, uh, we forgot we the haircut, bad this week, the so we... shave. Um, the shirts aren't tucked in, so well, our Arch producer... Is Arch is looking at me like... <laughs> He's looking at us like, y'all don't look good. I look fine. Shock <laughs> always looks clean. He's a TV guy. Oh, oh, so anyway, we will be back on you uh, in full video display very soon, and you will probably see some new digs surrounding us, which we are very excited for mm. uh, in the near future. So without further ado, let's get into what we are talking about today. Of course, we're going to revisit the Falcons-Saints game down in New Orleans. What happened in that one? We obviously got a lot of talk about Desmond Ritter. We will fast forward, talk about this weekend, another road game against the Baltimore Ravens, and then... Maybe some story time, some cold weather games that the guys have played in throughout their careers, holiday games, uh, because one thing you know in the NFL, the NFL doesn't stop for holidays. Mm -mm. If Thanksgiving, Christmas falls on days where they play games, they play games, okay? So uh, we will talk a little bit about those three. So let's get into it, guys. We talked about this last week. Obviously, the big storyline going into the Saints game was the Falcons with a brand new rookie quarterback making his debut in Desmond Ritter. Atlanta Falcons fall to the Saints 21-18. Dave, I want to start with you. You were there. You were breaking it down every moment of the way. Let's start with this because I felt like this was kind of a, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a turning point because it's the beginning of the game. If you could script out a lot of things for a rookie quarterback making his first start, you generally wouldn't script out a 14-0 deficit midway through the first quarter. And I felt like that was where this team, not just Desmond Ritter, the entire team got themselves into a pickle. You got a rookie quarterback making his first start, and before he even blinks, he's down 14 points. Yeah, know, by the way, you're probably in the worst place you could possibly be as a Falcon player to be playing <laughs> in the Superdome in New Orleans against your arch rival. Um I thought that it gave you an opportunity, and I know a lot of people wanted to see what this guy was made of or what he would do, and he didn't flinch. He, he just, you know, we, we came out, went three and out offensively. It was not a good series, and then, of course, they got the touchdown pass from Taysom Hill, and it's 14 nothing in a blink of an eye. You've had the ball for three plays. Mm -hmm. He did a really good job of staying in the moment, staying in the game, and I thought those are the kind of things, obviously, we wanted the numbers, and the numbers weren't there. And... I think numbers will come, and I'll give you some numbers of other guys that have played in their first starts. But what you wanted to see was how he handled the situation. One, the adverse situation with the stadium and who you're playing against. Two, whatever situations presented themselves 14 nothing down, yep. obviously yep. the worst of the worst scenarios there. Um, but he didn't allow that to affect him. He stayed even keel throughout the game, and I thought he got better as the game went along. I thought he was antsy shock early on. I thought you could see it in the first couple throws. He didn't want a negative play, meaning he didn't want a sack, and we as quarterbacks always know we want to make the guys around us feel good about themselves, mm -hmm. especially early in the game, whether it's a receiver, a running back, certainly your offensive line. You don't want them to see you laying on the ground behind them because you've held the ball too long. I thought he got antsy and tried to pull it down too early. Yeah. That steadied and settled as well. So that part of it I really like. Now, yeah. the numbers were not there, and, and we'll talk about that, but the numbers will come, I think. Yeah. But I just like the way he handled his business. Yeah, uh, Arch, it's great to have you guys both here talking about this because we got two quarterbacks, right? And, DJ, you guys can speak to, like, yeah, we could sit here and we could, we could dive into X's and O's and, oh, he missed this pass or didn't manage the play clock this way, but – DJ, just talk about like the things that were probably going through his mind early on in that game that he was having to fight through that you talked about, Arch, and then what you saw as the game kind of wore on. I think the operation part of it is where you look at a young quarterback, especially in an environment like that. How do you operate within the pocket? How you operate in the huddle? How you operate just getting the play call? Because mm -hmm. obviously this is totally different. Now you've had a week. You've had all, you know, kind of all season to kind of get yourself ready to go as far as, you know, preparing as a starter. But it's something different about when you get in the game and you're actually the guy and you have to run the show. There's no 
coach behind you like it is in practice yelling, hey, we got to get this guy lined up or whatever it is. You have to be in total command and control while you're out there. So I thought operational, he did a really good job of doing it. Arch mentioned it, an environment like that, just getting lined up. And this offense has a lot of checks, has a lot of, you know, different things that the quarterback motions. has to do, motion at the line of scrimmage, get everybody lined up, and then get the ball snapped. We didn't see a lot of, you know, false starts. We didn't see a lot of that kind of stuff happen in the ball game. And I thought he did a good job operationally of just getting the play out. And then here comes execution later. Like I said, the numbers, they're going to come. And I think you look at early in the ball game, we didn't help ourselves as much as on first and second down being in good situations. Mm-hmm. And you think about, you know, first play of the game, you're taking a shot to, to CP and, hey, it's an incomplete pass and here you are, you're second and ten. Or you try to run the football and then, you know, a couple, you know, series later and you get nothing or you get a negative yardage play. So you're already putting this guy behind the eight ball. And Arch mentioned it, as a quarterback, when you're already in second ten, second and eleven or whatever it is, you don't want to contribute to – the negative yardage play. So you don't want to get a sack. You don't want to turn the ball over. And I think early in the game, you can see him just trying to get the ball out of his hands. And like you mentioned, Arch, he was a little antsy with it at times, maybe an overthrow here or maybe, you know, just trying to get rid of it and all that kind of stuff. I, I think he did a good job operational uh, as far as, you know, playing the game through. Um, but I, I think also we could have helped ourselves better on early downs that could have helped him especially once you get to second and third down. Yeah, you know, we talked about this um, a little bit last week, and, and I don't want to take anything away from the Saints, but I know, Arch, you talked about, like, it's a good defensive front going up against Atlanta, and Cam Jordan has made a career, unfortunately, against the Atlanta Falcons, so it wasn't like his his work was going to be easy trying to navigate the, the opposing color jerseys that were coming against him. So, Arch, you talked a little bit about numbers. He was just 50% passing, 13 to 26, 97 yards, no touchdowns, no picks. I know you wanted to talk a little bit about numbers. The one thing I would add that I think is positive, again, you're trying to extrapolate positives moving down the road or even in the future for a really talented young quarterback, is still no Kyle Pitts in the game. But he definitely made a concerted effort to get the ball in the hands of Drake London. Yeah. Seven catches, 70 yards, but he had 11 targets. So he went the direction of the first-round pick 11 times in the game. I think that bodes well for trying to get the ball into the hands of playmakers. And now we just got to hope, Arch, that the accuracy, that he gets a little bit more lasered in. Yeah, and I think that the, those guys can help him some too, right? It, it, you would mentioned the first play out of the box, you take the shot to CP. Horrible route by Patterson. Patterson's got bump and run coverage. He saves him no room no along room. the sideline. There's no yeah. place to throw the ball. Yeah. I love the idea of taking the shot, but you're the veteran player. Take a little time to line the scrimmage, run by the guy, but give me some room to throw the football. Didn't help him at all there. Drake London had a couple of routes where he didn't run to the proper depth. He didn't get to the proper depth, which changes where the ball enters you. Yep. If you're at the proper depth and the ball comes out, now maybe it's on the front, front number. But because you get short, now it's on the back hit. Yep. And those are little things that happen. So he needed the guys around him to help him out. Um, and, and I think that, that that will come because some of those guys will settle in and do something. Now, Drake did really a couple of really cool things. You mentioned the numbers or in what his numbers were. There's one in particular route. I know the one you're, you know what I'm talking about where Drake's got a little pop pass to the inside and there's two windows. There's one outside the backer or inside the backer. And – when Ritter lets the ball go, the ball looks like it's going right at Demario Davis. Well, Drake attacks the football, undercuts him, takes the ball away, and pushes it up the field for another 10, 10 yards or so. So there you kind of start to see that marriage kind of yeah. coming together, those yeah. two guys. Um, Numbers-wise, real quickly, John Elway, and again, I'm don't make a mistake, I'm not trying to compare Ritter <laughs> to the guys I'm going to mention here, but just give you a perspective. Now, some guys have, have lit it up, and they're only starting. Matt Ryan – Threw a 65-yard touchdown pass on his first pass. Mm-hmm. And that's the guy everybody wanted to run out of town. Let's yeah. not forget that. So, but John Elway, one for eight, an interception, 14 yards, his first start. The guy that we consider the GOAT, who we're going to see at the end of the season, he had 13 completions, did uh, Tom Brady, in his first game as a New England Patriot starter for 160 yards. The next week, he had 12 completions for 90 yards. <laughs> Didn't throw a touchdown and pass in either one of his first two Not games. Not quite lighting mm-hmm. it up, is it, Dave? No, yeah. but uh, it just it, it, and that's where perspective has to fall in. We tried to talk about the patience level, and I think I even tweeted something out about, you know, hey, give the kids some time yeah. because this isn't. We're not talking about going to play Madden. Yeah, 
you know, like you said, there was a guy, there's a, there's a guy that's made a living playing against the Falcons and Cam Jordan, yeah. who's standing on the other side waiting to come get you. Yeah. Um, so those things got to keep in perspective. You know, I, I'll add something for uh, the fans to kind of uh, think about. There, there are three plays I, I broke down uh, this week on AtlantaFalcons.com of some of the things that he did well in this ball game. And one was, Arch, you remember this, they go five wide, they go empty set, and Drake's in the slot. He's got Tyron Matthew covering him in the slot. Mm-hmm. Pro Bowl veteran guy. What he does pre-snap to post-snap is they go spread, and you got to figure out where's the leverage, who, who, who I know can win, uh, what's happening. He goes away from rotation, throws the inside slant. Tyron Matthew's playing outside leverage. On the other side, you got OZ run the same kind of slant, but on the other side, the guy has inside leverage. From pre-snap to post-snap, he knew exactly which way to go with the football first off and then deliver the strike. This was on third and six. Yeah. Completion move the chains. There's another play. They go play action left, and Drake's running like a little, little semi-over route, and he's got a nickel coming off the edge. Stands in there, know he's going to get hit. Toughness stands in there, takes a shot, delivers the ball to Drake. Nice, easy completion. There's the, and his last one was he's throwing – you got – you got Drake coming on the big over route. You got Michael Pruitt coming on a, a over route as well. Play action away. And the linebackers, they were fooled at first, but they got back under it. He does a good job of holding Michael Pruitt up in the hole instead of leading him across the field where the linebackers were going. This is just all stuff that, you know, never comes up in a statute as far as what he's seeing, being able to see the field, not just throwing it to an area or, okay, he's supposed to go and, and throw it across the field. He throws it to to a guy, it makes him open pretty much. So there were a lot of things he did in the ball game that when you turn on the tape, you say, okay, those are things that are absolutely teachable things that you can learn from and say, hey, these are good things. Obviously, there are things you can work on, but there are always things that you turn on the tape that people may not see and say, okay, that's something that you can absolutely build on going forward. Yeah, and Shock and I are going to sit here and try to convince you as a Falcon fan that this guy is the next guy. This is going to be the, the guy. What we're trying to give you an idea of is some of the growth we saw in the game. Right. Because this guy hasn't played since mm-hmm. back in August, okay? So to get a chance to get in and play in real live action is a different scenario. And then and then to try to compare it to what's what's going on with, with other guys that have been in similar situations. He made some bad throws in the game. He had three throws that could have been picked off. Yep. yep. That's what happens with a young quarterback, too. <laughs> yep. You misread something. The speed of the game catches up with you because it's a different speed in the NFL than it is at Cincinnati yep. where he was playing in college, and you got to learn learn that deal. But he, he take that for what it's worth, a couple of throws that probably were ill-advised, but also don't forget you took over the ball on your own 10-yard line with the game in doubt. It, the game's on the line. He took it from the 10-yard line. They drove all the way down the field, and on fourth down and eight, he throws a completion to Drake London that puts you in field goal range. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a chance to tie the football game. Oh, by the way, there's enough time in the game. You may go win the game. So this is the same dude yep. that struggled maybe yep. early and maybe threw a couple balls. You say, well, wait, that should have been picked off. Yeah, okay. But it didn't, and so you play out the circumstances you're handed in a game. He was handed a, a long field, a 90-yard field, to try to go win the football game. And he gave, you, he gave you a chance to win it. I don't want this to be the apologies for this, that, or yep. the other. Yep. You know, there's two scenarios there. He had made some mistakes, but he also did some really good stuff. Let the kid grow because he's got some – got, there's a knack about him. I wanted to, to, to bring one last thing up, and then we'll move on. I know you guys saw this, but you talked about making some mistakes, not necessarily seeing it, or learning from it. Right before halftime, they're driving down, and – they had, I want to believe it was like a second and seven, okay? Again, I don't know what his progression is. I don't know what his read is. But Zacchaeus ran like a like a comeback or a deep speed out to the sideline. And I thought he had it. If, if you are in the groove and you throw that ball on anticipation, right? Like it has to happen in the NFL. You got to throw that ball before he comes out of his break. That way when he turns around, the ball's right there. Instead, he hesitated a little bit and the DB came in and knocked it away. That was, you potentially, that's first down right there. They were already on the New Orleans 47-yard line, okay? Let's just say they drive down. It's 14-3 at that time. Let's say they drive down and they punch it in right before half. What happened right after half? They drove down and scored scored again. So those are those times when we talk about, like, as broadcasters, 
can you get that two for one? Mm -hmm. Can you get the score right before halftime? And then you get the ball coming back in the third quarter. Double dip. You got a chance to double dip, right? Yeah. To me, that could have changed the complexion of the game. And it's probably a throw they're going to watch on tape. And he's going to say, if I'd have cut it loose, I probably go. had it, right? Yeah. And those are the things that come with experience when he's just got to know that he's going to throw them open, right, with anticipation. All right, so let's transition away from Desmond Ritter a little bit because you talk about positives on offense. Guys, it was a coming out party for Algier, okay? Like, he's been a force all season, but it was almost to me, guys, like, I watched that game and I was like, this guy might truly be the running back of the future. The way that he played, the physicality, the vision that he played with. How many third down running plays did he get to connect? I think it was six at the last count, third down plays that they ran it and he converted yeah. for a first down. Yeah. It's almost like the maturation that we're wanting to see from Desmond Ritter, we're already starting to see it, DJ, from Algier. And you, you can, when you watch him run, you know he runs with an angry intent. And there were a couple times in the game where it looked like he probably should have gained no yards, yeah. one yard. And he ends up with four, five, six yards. And the physicality, like you mentioned, he runs with is fun to watch. And you can tell he he kind of feeds on it as the game goes on. And he continues to run and pound and run. I, the, the one thing that I think, you know, watching him that I've kind of uh, kind of been more impressed with is his vision. And the touchdown run was supposed to be an outside zone. You can see everybody's reaching. And even if you watch it on film, his eyes are outside. His eyes are going outside zone and he comes and cuts it all the way back and hits that hole and punches it in and runs through a couple of arm tackles. Those are the things that, that are hard to teach. Some guys just have, it, some guys don't. Yeah. And you can see he has that physicality. And you, you talk about, you talk about Algier. I thought this was another really good game by the rookies. Mm -hmm. You talk about the Angela Malone had a tackle for loss Ebby Katie had the, 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 the fumble, the cause fumble there on like third and one uh, in the ball game. We talked about London, talked about Ritter. Uh, Troy Anderson got his first start. I mean, these rookies are making major production here as the season goes on. And I know we're talking about Algier. I mean, first, first game over 100 yards, you know, uh, second touchdown of the year. I mean, all that kind of stuff is great, but he brings a different intensity for this offense, and he gives you exactly what you want in the run game. 17 carries, 139 yards. He actually eclipsed 100 yards early on in the third quarter. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was already knocked off of his list. But um, again, the physicality that he played with, I thought was quite impressive. Um, and it's a, another one of those positives that Atlanta has moving forward. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on the Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search, so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. Speaking of moving forward, uh, Atlanta Falcons goes on the road this week again to play the Baltimore Ravens. Dave, I want to ask you about the Ravens because as I did a little bit of recon, <laughs> obviously Lamar Jackson has been out for a few weeks. Word on the street is that he might come back this weekend for the game. Again, don't know if that's true yet. Don't know what his true percentage of health will be in that game. But all the stuff going around Baltimore, fellas, is that offense has been anemic ever since Lamar Jackson left, that Hundley's not able to move the ball down the field. They have not been scoring very many points. Uh, J.K. Dobbins has come back from an injury, but he doesn't seem to have that same kind of burst that he's had early on in the season or in his career. What do you see from Baltimore? What type of animal is Atlanta going to face this week, if you will? Yeah, it's a very uncertain, uh, certainly on the offensive side of the ball, because they're a different, they're a different flavor if Lamar plays, right? Yep. I mean, now all of a sudden you've got a dynamic run entity that can take it to the house from anywhere on the field. So that changes who you're going to be, and that will be the real challenge this week, get ready defensively, because Shatley, the young kid, he can move around, the kid out of Utah, the, the, the backup quarterback, but they've been – they haven't been very good. What, three points this weekend in their loss? Yeah, to the Browns, uh, yeah. So the Browns. So, um, so you, that might be a problem in trying to prepare. I guess you try to prepare for De Lamar 
and then you kind of settle into whatever you're going to get. Because their yeah. pass game is not going to change with Lamar in the game. Maybe a little bit more RPO, potentially, or a little bit zone, a little more zone read. But so you prepare for that. I guess you prepare for Lamar and see if he plays. Um, a lot going on with him. Obviously, yeah. he's got a he's a contract scenario going on. Does he come back? The injury, that's all him. That's a problem they've got up there. Defensively, they're always salty. Yeah. Now, this is a team that gets after you defensively. Um, they've got guys all over the field that can play, whether it's the corner spot, the linebacker spot, along the defensive front. They're big. They're physical. Um, so that will be a real challenge. But as soon as I say that, every time we line up against one of these kind of teams, we shove the ball right down yeah. their throat. Yeah. We ran for 200 yards against the Saints this weekend. Um, and I don't, they're as good a front seven as you're going to have. Demario, mm-hmm. you mentioned uh, the run that, that uh, you get down the goal line by Algier. He runs through Demario Davis. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about just threw an arm out. He ran through him. And that's one to of the more the thicker physical he, linebackers. He's in the one league. of the best tackle tackle linebackers yeah. you're going to see in the league. Guy's an outstanding tackler. So the physicality in the run game's there. Can we be better protection wise? And can Des make some plays in the pass game against this really good Baltimore defense? Remember, Baltimore lost that game. They now fall a game behind Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. So if you look big picture, they it's a it. huge game for them yeah. because they get an opportunity to potentially pull themselves close. Cincinnati's playing at New England. So what's going on there? So they're in New England's in a race. So there's a lot going on here late in the season for them as far as their seeding and where they might be in the playoffs. Um, and for Atlanta as well because because uh, of the way the NFC South is stacked up. Yeah, first time this season, DJ, the Ravens have not been on top of their division due to their loss last week. Offense has been, uh, I mentioned, it's been a struggle for them without having Lamar Jackson in the game. Dave mentioned it, right? You get him back in the game and, and you hear this all the time, right? Is Lamar Jackson at 85% better than most quarterbacks, especially of his style, right? He wants to run the football. He wants to get around the perimeter and he can make a defense pay. What do you see as, as some of the keys in this game for Atlanta to kind of get off the schneid here if they've kind of racked up a few losses? I think similar to, to what Archer's talking about, the efficiency in the pass game has to be there. Um, we've seen the run game go all year. I mean, I think you got 12 games over 100 yards this year, four games over 200. So you know the run game's going to travel wherever you go, and that's kind of been the MO of this team. If you can find a way to be more efficient in the pass game, and number two, take care of the football. Mm-hmm. I went, like you said, the little recon looked up some stuff, and the Ravens have 23 takeaways on the season, which is third most in the league. So that tells you they're going to rake the ball yeah. out. They're going to try to go for it. They're going to get after you. That's kind of the thing that they've kind of leaned on. Yeah. And obviously that's a big part of what they do. And, you know, uh, we've both seen these Baltimore defense over the years, how, you know, exotic and how crazy they can be. Uh, you got a short week coming in here, one less day to get ready and prepare for this. They have to be on their P's and Q's when it comes to the things you see on defense. So I think you got to take care of the football, and the offense has to be uh, a little bit more efficient. And we, we can always, you know, give our offense a couple more possessions too. That'll always help in a ball game when you got a chance to uh, play on the road in this atmosphere. And like you guys both mentioned, this is a big time game for Baltimore. It's a big time game for Atlanta. Yeah. So we both uh, will come in this game, uh, I think, you know, ready to go because it means so much as we got three games to go. Just One the, thing I would yeah, like to ahead. mention about the, just reflecting back on this game, and I know we haven't touched on it, um, with, but the kind of the scary moment that happened with Dean Pease early oh, on yeah. in the game, and uh, Dean got knocked down, for those that didn't see, got knocked down by the punt returner during warm-ups, uh, kind of got blindsided, kind of whiplashed, uh, and Dean went down. They took him off the field on a stretcher. He went to the local hospital, was later discharged, fine, just a concussion, uh, came back to actually came back to the stadium there late third quarter, early fourth quarter, and watched the remainder of the game from the locker room. And he flew back with us after the game. So Dean's fine, and, and I know everybody's kind of been wondering about that. I'd like to give Frank Bush and the staff, Ted Monachino, all those guys that kind of came together. That's a so that's, that's a jar that's a jarring situation. Yeah. Now Frank had called defenses before. He'd been an interim defensive coordinator with the Jets. He'd been the defensive coordinator in Houston. So it's not his first rodeo in calling a defense. But when you're 20 minutes before kickoff, and they said, oh, by the way, you're calling the defense. Yeah. You know, yeah, you've got some mindsets in, and you've got some ideas that you're going to contribute to Dean, who's calling the defense. But you're not, you're not calling the defense right. in your mind 20 minutes before. Now all of a sudden you are. So I give the defense a lot of credit. They got off to a slow start. And I didn't think it was because the defensive plays called. I thought it was because of play on the field. 
I thought Richie Grant made a mistake on the on the post route. Should mm. never have undercut the play. Yep. It was just a poor play by him, yep. not because of the defensive call. But when you got the turnover late, deep in your own territory, down 14-3, to three, the game changed. You got a turnover. They made some adjustments to the what, what uh, New Orleans was doing. And all of a sudden, Andy Dalton wasn't quite as comfortable as he'd mm-hmm. been early in the game. They're just sitting back. They started coming with some pressures. You got Zoe come off the edge, hits him in the, in the back. Give credit for the defensive staff. They've done it all year long. They've made adjustments. Yep. Not just Dean Pease, but that staff. And I just wanted to throw some kudos towards Frank Bush and that staff yep. for coming together in an adverse situation, knowing that their hearts are going with the defensive coordinator because you don't know what's going on with him. Right. And you right. think about the defensive players that he that love him too. Mm-hmm. You don't know what's going on with your guy. And yep. yet I got to go play a game. I just thought that that was that was an impactful moment that showed the guys a lot of maturity and a lot of galvanizing together. 112 yards and seven points in the second half. I mean yep. that's that's pretty good. Yep. <laughs> Settled in. Yeah. Um, so you're right, Dave. I mean, Frank, he's got experience calling plays, but it's in that situation without that he has not been the voice of the defense, right? So he's thinking to himself, how do I get our, our defense in the right situation but make it feel like Dean, right? Because at that moment, you're trying to make it feel yeah. as normal as possible to the players on the field, right? Can I can I call in the same type of things that they're, they're normally used to seeing in these situations, down a distance, where we're at in the field, what the score of the game is? So a lot of things going through his mind, just trying to keep the ship moving the right direction. Right. But you're right. I'm glad you pointed that out. And one last thing, I mean, Arch mentioned it just, you know, not to call any guys out. You talked about Richie Grant, and, you know, that's a play that Richie, you know, probably will tell you himself that, you know, he took the wrong angle and, you know, whatever it is. You think about the touchdown to Johnson. We lose him coming across on a shallow cross. That's execution. That's yeah. not the play call. It's not uh, you not, you're not knowing where you're supposed to be. That's just execution on your behalf. So that's, you know, 14 points right there that if you're just in the right position, those pr- plays probably don't happen. So, uh that's a good call by Arch talking about Coach Bush and Dean Pease and that defense coming together because there were a lot of moments in that game that uh, just execution-wise, if you're just in the right spot, you make the play. All right, guys, before we go, let's let's kind of turn the tone a little bit, have a little bit of a fun, maybe a little story time here. We are in December, okay, and we are playing football, which generally happens outdoors, <laughs> which if anybody watched the Monday night game, you saw all kinds of frost and steam coming out of the mouths of the players up in Green Bay. There is, um, what do they call it, an Arctic bomb or yeah. something like that going around the country right now yeah. where uh, there's some really cold temperatures. Jim Cantori's bringing it to it. <laughs> that was just uh, on the weather app a little earlier today. Uh, the blizzard conditions more, right? will be um, entering the atmosphere at 74 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> But let me ask you guys this. Can you think back in your career? Not only are we in December with very cold temperatures and the Falcons are traveling north, but we are also around holiday time. So, Arch, can you remember a time when you played in a really cold or snowy game or you played on a holiday, which either you were happy about, you were upset about, you played really well, you didn't play really well because of the day or the holiday? Well, I I don't know why a lot of my stories eventually go back to me having to play an 85 bear defense. But uh, we played played in Chicago on a really crisp late November day. Uh, and it was cold. It, I think the kickoff, it was right around 23 degrees, 24 degrees, but it was a bright, sunshiny day. Anybody that knows where uh, that stadium is, is right near Lake oh, Michigan, water. right? Yeah. So, yeah. But there was no wind. It was just a clear, crisp day. Now, the 85 Bear defense was staring across me. And, They're and not me clear and, and crisp. And, and they were, they, they <laughs> were clear and crisp about putting me on the ground is what <laughs> they, they were. They probably made it about 10 degrees cooler. But it was, it was cold, and they're hitting you, and you don't really want to be hit, period. But <laughs> certainly not when things are breaking your body, off your body when it's that cold. We went in at halftime. We were down, I don't know, 17 nothing at halftime or something like that. We came back out. A lot of guys didn't want to come back yeah. out. But we, came, we, came, we came back out. And all of a sudden, things had changed. Something's falling from the sky, okay, and it's like pieces of ice, and it was the old turf, and it was sticking in the turf, and it was like razor blades, and so when you went down, (laughs) just ripped your arms and your hands up, so not only am I being destroyed by these humans that are are (laughs) superhumans that are on the other side of the ball, now I'm falling on, Uh, what is this? uh, First you're getting broken, and then you're getting sliced (laughs) over. (laughs) This was the most miserable experience. We couldn't <laughs> wait. You talk about wanting to get on the bus after yeah. the third quarter. Yeah. yeah, we wanted to get out of there. <laughs> it, and I, I think I've told the story about that playing against that team. And 
I think that was a, that was a, a stretch where they had four consecutive shutouts during mm-hmm. the season, and we happened to be one of them, and that was just a miserable experience. He's getting tortured one, alive, huh? But the one <laughs> the one that sticks out of my mind more than anything else is we go up there, and I'm a broadcaster, and we're playing in Chicago, what oh five oh six? Okay, yeah. So it was like a Sunday night. It was in December. Yes, we go up there. And I had a pretty good idea that Mike wasn't interested in playing in that game. Vic mm-hmm. wasn't. Interested. It was mm-hmm. cold, it cold, was cold. Miserable. But I knew we were in trouble when I walked out on the field pregame. And they said, "Well, how do you know that?" Brian Erlacher is standing in the middle of the field, all six foot five, two hundred fifty-five pounds no on shirt. him. He's got a cut-off no cut T-shirt off, yeah. on, yeah. bald head, and steam is coming off his head. Yeah. I looked over at uh, West Durham. I said, "We got no chance. <laughs> <laughs> we in <had> trouble." <laughs> We ain't winning this game, baby. And they thumped us. I don't care. Arch, I, I, I remember that yeah. game, and I'll never forget that I'm standing on the sidelines, right, going out to, to punt, and I'm trying to get my hands warm. So when I get out there, I've got good feeling in my hands. Two things happened from the time I left the heater on the sideline <laughs> until I got in between the hashes yeah. to snap the ball. Number one, my hands that were warm were now frozen again <laughs> in the matter of seven seconds it took me to get out to the middle of the field. And number two, when I touched the football, it was like they just pulled it out of a freezer. Yeah. I was going to be like, did somebody yeah. just have this in a bag yeah. or something? Oh, yeah. Like, how is this so cold? And it was like, you want to talk about one of the worst, like that one. NFC Championship up in Philadelphia oh, was yeah. pretty rough when they were trying yeah. to shovel the snow out of the stands yeah. before we played that game. Yeah. DJ, I know you're a Southern boy. You played at Georgia. Any other ones that you can remember? That one rings bells for me because <laughs> I remember before that game, and usually Garris is sold. Coach Knapp would always come, and we would all sit down, me, him, shopping, and we'd be going over the plan and what we're going to do in this situation. And all I remember is Mike, Nap, get away from me. I need to find gloves. I need to find <laughs> other shirts. He wasn't trying to hear we it. Were, everybody was so worried about the clothing that we were going to wear going out <laughs> and socks and how were you going to manage it. Because I remember we went out for warm-ups, and we were back in, no lie. It had to be within four minutes of going outside. There was no chance anybody <laughs> wanted to be out there any longer than they had to. I remember uh, a game in college. We were playing Georgia Tech, and it was in Atlanta, and it was cold. It was raining. It was probably about probably about 30 some degrees. And this is, you know, pretty cool. Late November. We're playing Georgia Tech. David Green gets hurt. I come in the game. You're talking about the worst game I ever played in my life because I was <laughs> cold and I was wet. And I'm coming off the bench. So I'm like, and this was the last game that fans remembered before going into my last year. <laughs> so they was like, this is the guy that's taking over for us next year. <laughs> I'm talking about I couldn't complete a pass. I couldn't grip the ball. Those games are the worst. So yeah. I give a lot of credit to those dudes that play out there in Green Bay and Chicago. And do this Chicago four or five and, times a year. Oh, it's unbelievable. Well, you're so right about the ball, though. And I know the fans, and maybe you've gone outside and thrown some catch, played some catch outside. But when you're in those games and those balls are stuck in the bags and they're getting new balls and bringing fresh balls out, and a lot of the, the kicking balls come out, and they've been sitting over there. Um if you remember the movie The Christmas Story, if you haven't seen it, it's an old Christmas story. Mm-hmm. It's an old movie. But remember when the kid sticks his tongue on the post? <laughs> <laughs> That's what the ball feels like. Yeah. That's what the ball Don't feels put like. your so, tongue on the post. Yeah. So Van Note snaps me the ball, and now my hand is stuck to the football, <laughs> and I've got, I've got Richard Dent coming this direction. I've got single. T- I can't get rid of it because it's stuck to my tongue. I can't get it out. It's brutal. So, yeah, oh, those, my goodness. It, nobody wants to play in it, folks. Everybody says, oh, they're used to it. No, they're not. They don't want to play in it either. They just get used to going out and starting they know their car. So they have a, that's I mean, exactly right. I heard right? stories of Brady wearing scuba suits out of New England because it's so cold. Like, that's the kind of stuff you got to deal with. Yeah. Um, by the way, there are uh, Falcons fans that live in Minnesota and in Boston that just heard you complain about the weather in yes. Georgia <laughs> yes. in November, <laughs> yes. and they checked out. Yeah. They, they didn't even hear the rest of the story. Hey. They're like, He's, is he complaining about cold in November what they say. in Georgia? Yes, yes. It's supposed to be cold in Baltimore this weekend. I think they're predicting seven degrees in Baltimore on what? Saturday. What? We're going to take shock up and take it out. <laughs> no, I can't make that it. That bald head, that's Steve coming up that bald head. <laughs> can't make it. <laughs> 
<laughs> By the way, I'm just getting oh, quick, no. quick revision. Bomb cyclone is what they're bomb calling it. Oh. Potential bomb cyclone happening across some parts of the country. Now, do you Potential get a jacket? Do you blizzard. get a jacket with all that? Do you get the, the, the weather channel weather jacket? Channel? Yeah, did you get the jacket too? It's just a heat press. It's not the embroidered okay, one. So it's, okay. like, it's almost like you're not official. Right. You if you wash saying? it, it comes so up. So Archie, yeah, Archie got to make sure our, our, our fame producer, Sam Larson, we got Mike over here, they're all going to Baltimore as well. Yeah. So you got to give them some, some, some weather gear. Get the well, parka, boys. You can bet that these guys, when they show up at the stadium, they'll look like the Michelin man. They'll have so much <laughs> stuff on them. They won't be able to move. <laughs> they're going to see you before the game, Arch. They're going to be like, um, can we go up to the press box? Because I heard it's nice and warm. Oh, there. man. Oh, they'll be up is there. It, is it, is it open or is it closed yeah. in the press box? Oh, we'll, we'll keep our door. You know, we keep our window open. Yeah, yeah. You gotta be able to feel it. You gotta be able to feel it. You gotta be a part of it. You gotta be a part of it. I'll put my Christmas hat on too, by the way. Blinking ah. off and on my Falcon Christmas tweet. Tweet that out for us. Yeah, make tweet sure we get a picture of that, that Arch. Yeah. All right, folks, that's gonna do it here at Falcons Audible, presented by ATT. We hope to be back on screen because I know you're looking at yeah. you wanting to see these for faces. Show. For sure. Uh, we're hoping to be back on screen next week, but I can't make any promises. If we are back on screen, you're if gonna we see not us. blame Sam Larson. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> You can send all your uh, <laughs> mail to him, please, at the Atlanta Falcons. The address is, never mind, I won't go there. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, folks. We'll be back, uh, hopefully, talking about a Falcons victory over the Ravens next week. Let's Have go. a great day, everybody. Sleigh bells ring, oh. <laughs> are you listening? Merry Christmas! Yeah.